come to that. <laughs> okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce Sada Mabinet. Uh, Sada is a, a PhD with SDCP. She did her PhD with ARM in Amsterdam. I hope I'm, I'm not doing anything wrong, but Sada will tell me if, you, if I am. Then she did a postdoc with Isabel Ligieri in Montpellier, and then uh, she came back to Portugal to do work with the um, uh, Isabel Gordo in experimentalization at the IPC. And then she finally landed here at SCU, <laughs> where she started uh, her own group. And she's been working on uh, plants for people interaction uh, and understanding how, uh, uh, and more recently, ah, it doesn't, we don't see it. I'm going to leave you. Been working with <laughs> plant herbivore interactions and how um, individual variation in, uh, uh, in response to different environmental variables affects species coexistence. She's also been working on how sexual uh, reproduction, uh, sexual selection um, uh, uh, affects the uh, adaptation to different environments. I think I hope I don't get it wrong. Um, she's also been working with trying to make uh, a bridge between um, science and society by forming the area of ecological caravan. And um, and her, she, she, I don't know, I don't know if they're allowed to do this, but in 2016, she won an ERC that allowed her to actually do a very big load of experiments to try to understand how each, uh, with individual variation niche with uh, a competition between species and um, uh, niche modification affected uh, <laughs> and uh, between species. And so I think today she's going to talk about this and also about the material that are. Thank you. Can you hear me? No. The sound is not. Super good. Enough. Enough. Mm, ta mal, ta mal. Can you hear me? Okay, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. okay. Nós conseguimos ouvir, só que vocês estão ao fundo de uma sala qualquer a fazer eco, está confuso. Está... Faz um bocadinho de eco, sim. Podiam estar ao pé do microfone respectivo. Mas, por exemplo, quando a Inês estava a falar, o microfone dela estava desligado e a gente estava a ouvi-la através de, de outro sítio. Grande, ela veio para o pé do microfone grande, mas pelo jeito... Agora, agora melhorou. Agora, agora, agora está bom. Sim, agora de repente, de repente ficou bom, sim. Boa. Pronto. Sim, agora está bem. A Inês fez a sua magia do costume. So, hi everyone. I'd like to thank Inês for having introduced me on such a short notice. I have to say that she did it very well. You did very well, Inês. Congratulations. Uh, and this was basically the most important part of this presentation, was just to make sure that uh, Inês is prepared to be a proper PI and introduce people. And so I hope you enjoyed it and then see you next week. <laughs> okay, other than that, I might uh, try to give you a presentation also. Uh, so I need to share my screen, right? My cake, my cup assistant? Yes. Share screen. Share screen. Share screen. Share. Data. Data. Okay. Can you see? Yes. Yes? Pá, mas eu quero, eu não quero que vejam aqui as minhas notas. Estão a ver as minhas notas? Ah, what they see, está? No, no. They see the other one. They see my screen. We are seeing your notes. Yes, I don't want you to see my notes, Candela. No, it's a show that you can't do it. Um, I'm not sure. Ah, screen two, screen two, screen two. We saw what thing. Good. Yeah? Okay. Now? Now you see my notes? No, eh? No. no. Good. So, uh, thank you very much for. Uh, coming here today in this uh, uh, Encontro Ciência, which 
unfortunately is online. Um, um, so I want to say that um, you will notice that there's not a big uh, red thread throughout the presentation. So I will talk basically about two really different things and I really did not, I mean, I tried to connect them, but then I gave up because it was more confusing than just saying it's really two different things. So I'm going to first talk about everything that is related to coexistence and then everything that is related to host parasite interactions. Well, not everything, but everything that is in here. So I'd like to start by saying, okay, so I'd like to start by presenting uh, the, the research group that I re represent here, which is called the MIT2 group. Uh, I also want to say that this group is a sort of a, it's not it's not a real group. I mean, it's a group that I have in my head that, that maybe I should call it my family and not my group because, for example, Flor, which is just next to me here, can you see me pointing now? Uh, has left for two years now or something, but I still consider that she's part of my group. And uh, and Ines that is uh, here no, next no, no, to no. me physically now. Uh, I also think that she's part of my group, but uh, it's well, not on. really, really true. Um, and, and I hope that everyone will be part of my group until they die. So, so you know, this might be, suppose that some of them will be in South America and still be part of my group. Um, so, uh, importantly, I want, to stu I want you to focus on the people that I will not talk about further on which is uh, Juan Lopez, Ariana Thomas, and Andrea Mortagua, and the Brits Fia Costa, which are currently the, the technicians of the lab. So they are the ones that really are behind the scenes of everything that I'm going to show you from now on, okay? So and they are very, very important people, but when we give presentations, we tend to forget that, uh, that they exist. But if they wouldn't exist, none of this would be... Uh, possible. So, um, and now I'm also going to talk a bit about, tell you briefly what we do in general and then go to uh, my, the stuff that I'm going to present. So, what, uh, an important part of, uh, of uh, the stuff that we do is called the agroecological caravan. Uh, so it, it, it involves some people that are also not here anymore, like Sean Alpudrini. Alpudrinia, and in this, this is like a so sort of a, I, I used to call it a side project, I'm not sure I can do it anymore. And in this project, we, we sort of try to put, to, to bring together producers, consumers, researchers, and policymakers around uh, agroecological systems, people that are interested, interested in, in, in making agriculture more sustainable. But yeah, that's it. And then uh, there's also another important part of our research that turns around the sexual life of spider mites. And this is mostly divided into everything that is uh, interspecific. So the mating system of the spider mites, why do they mate with more than one uh, male or more than one female? What are the consequences thereof? What is the impact of temperature on the spider mite mating system? This type of things that is done mostly by Lunor and Sphere and was a bit by João Alpedrinha also when he was here. And, and then there's another part that is related to uh, interspecific sexual interactions and also the, the impact of symbionts therein, uh, which, which is led by Flor and uh, is uh, done a bit by Miguel Cruz, that is a PhD student of Flor, myself, and Vitor, and, and uh, that's it, okay? And then we work on the interaction between spider mites and metal accumulating plants. Basically, Diogo and Ines work on that. Then we, we work on the interaction between spider mites and plant defenses. We work on the coexistence and competition between spider mite species. And we work on virulence and transmission in spider mites. And today, I'm only going to talk about three, the three last parts of, uh, of, uh, of this uh, small list. So I'd like to take a step back and talk a bit about uh, where our research is situated. Um, and basically we work on the reciprocal interactions between ecology and evolution. And as you know, ecology and evolution, which are the two of the E's of our research center 
are uh, sort of uh, somehow intertwined. But there's also a big part of ecology that is, has nothing to do with evolution, such as, for example, community ecology. And there's a big part of evolution that has nothing to do with ecology, like, for example, the distribution of fictus effects of mutations. And, and the latest years are seeing a, a sort of a bigger interaction between these two research fields. And so, for example, Mark McApeak has written a, a book uh, years, some years ago, which is called The Evolution of Communities, so in which he puts community ecology with an evolutionary perspective. And uh, Richard Lewontin, which uh, passed away last year, uh, wrote also some years ago a book called The Triple Helix, in which he puts the fitness, the distribution of fitness effects of mutations within an environmental context. So there's more and more interactions between these research fields. Um, and basically this is mostly in part because we are, we, are, um, we are becoming aware of the fact that ecology and evolution operate at similar timescales. And this has fostered a lot of crosstalk. But, but I'm really not sure that, that this crosstalk is as fruitful as it could be. Or if it's just like, you know, we want to just, we, we do, are, are we doing a very uh, superficial contact between these disciplines? And I want to give you one example here, which is uh, niche location and niche width. So in, in ecology books, you see often this, um, sorry, this, night um, Karasas. You see often this graph, which is about limiting similarity. And basically what it says is if you have two species that are here in the center, they occupy similar niches. That is, there's a certain resource type, let's say the size of uh, seeds. And one species is, eats uh, one size of seeds and the other one eats another size of seeds. And they cannot eat very similar seed sizes because there will, there will be too much into specific competition. But if they also eat very separate seed sizes, there's too much into specific competition. And so there's a sort of a limiting similarity that puts them in the, the, the way that they, they occupy the niche is a sort of a balance between intraspecific and interspecific competition, okay? And then there's a whole uh, theory about the evolution of specialists and generalists that uh, has been developed a lot by Bruce Levins, which also died a few years ago, um, and which tells us all the conditions in which we expect the range of resources to be used by each species to be enlarged or, or, um, or be becoming smaller due to uh, trade-offs or uh, opportunities to use different resources. And if you look, these two uh, graphs or sets of graphs have the same axis. So the x-axis and the y-axis are the same in these two types of graphs. But the, 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 the conversation between the, the, or the communication between these research fields is really at very incipient. So nobody that works on limiting similarity considers the fact that the, that the resource, that the, the, the whole, that the range of resources can go wider or smaller. And nobody that works on specialists or generalists, or at least until recently has considered the impact of other species on on the range of resources used. So that's a bit sad. And also the other thing is that uh, the, this, these eco-evolutionary feedbacks make it that usually the way we see the, the, this, these graphs is that the resource type will affect the resource use. So for example, if there, if there is, um, well, okay, the, so the, the, this, this is the resource, the, the, the classical thing. But the other thing is that uh, uh, consumers can modify the resource types available and, and they, they, they can modify the environment in which they are, which then there will be, makes it that there will be a top-down effect of um, competitors or of, uh, of species on the environment. And this in turn may affect their evolution and, and their ecology. Okay. And this is also seldom incorporated in, in ecology and in evolution alike even though eco-evolutionary feedbacks is a very big term. So basically, there is more and more overlap between ecology and evolution, but these research fields are also expanding by themselves. 
So the relative overlap between these research fields is, I think, still relatively small uh, uh, compared to what it could be. Okay. And basically, and here in our group, we, we aim to contribute to a larger interplay between ecology and evolution by addressing uh, competition and host parasite interactions in a herbivore system. So the system that, uh, that we'll be working on is composed of two species that, uh, of spider mites, sorry, Tetranicus urtica and Tetranicus evansi, which um, uh, both feed on tomato plants and they uh, compete for resources. And we're going to, to investigate the interactions thereof. So I'll first be talking about niche modification and niche location, grouping two sets of uh, experiments, uh, mostly done by Joe Goudin. That's why he is uh, carrying the many. Um, and in part together with Arne Jensen, which was the Arne that uh, uh, <laughs> Ines said uh, in the beginning of this presentation, which was my PhD supervisor. And he was also uh, the supervisor of Diog doing his master's. And we've been uh, sort of collaborating on this. There's other people involved, including Christina Cruz and Teresa Dias from CSTC. And then there's another set of experiments that were done by Ines Fregata. And she did also a lot of computer work, as you can see in this uh, image. And that was done uh, uh, very closely together with Oscar Godoy, which we heard today is going to the interview of the ERC2. So we're very happy. And uh, also together with Raul Costa Pereira, Agnes Camacho, and Maria Cossack, which is part of our group. Um, so we, how do we see niche modification and niche location in our uh, system? By niche modification, we, we, we see that it's how herbivores interact with plant defenses. So it's how herbivores modify the defenses produced by, by plants, which are basically their environment. And niche locations is the subset of resources that we use. Uh, so, so I'll first show you some pretty old results about plant defenses, but they are important for you to understand the rest. So basically herbivores attack plants and then in response plants have evolved several layers of defenses against herbivores. Um, and uh, when, when they attack plants, generally this, this induces a chemical response in plants, uh, and the, this chemical response ultimately leads to the production of what is called protein has inhibitors. And protein has inhibitors are uh, protein that, uh, that uh, get into the herbivores and that sort of make their, their, their digestion much more difficult. So they, they reduce their feeding rates and by reducing their feeding rates, they also, this also has consequences on their performance. And so they sort of eat less, they, they, they produce fewer eggs, they, their populations grow less. And so this is ultimately, ultimately beneficial to the plants. And so uh, some years ago, Diogo set out to study what the, how, how our spider mite species interacted uh, with, uh, with plant defenses that had been previously done also by Renato Sarmiento, which was a PhD student of RNA. And uh, basically the way, the way he did that was by putting uh, uh, mites on a plant and then uh, letting it uh, feed for, for a while. And then three days later, he removed all these mites, picked up that leaf, and measured the, the protein has inhibitors, in particular the tryptin inhibitors in this case, and he also measured spider mite performance on those plants. So, and what he saw for uh, Tetranicus urtica was that indeed, if you compare control and um, control uh, plants without herbivores and plants with herbivores with Tetranicus urtica, which you see in these two different colors. If I could point, I could show you, but just look at the colors. Um, what you can see is that there are more, more protein has inhibitors produced in presence of the, 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 uh, the herbivore, which means that they induce plant defenses, okay? And then as a consequence, they also lay fewer eggs when you put them on those plants. So mites that are put on plants that have been pre-infested with mites lay fewer eggs 
than mites that are put on, on plants that have not been attacked uh, because there is an induction of plant defenses, okay? And then uh, Diogo looked at uh, what happened to the Tenxivansi. We actually already knew this, but he, he confirmed it in our populations. And what he saw was that in the case of Ivansi, basically what happens is that they, not only they don't trigger the plant defenses, but they actually, their presence leads to a, to a lower production of protein has inhibitors, which means that the, the defenses are lower. So we should expect a higher performance of mites on those plants, which is the case, as you can see here, plants infested, pre-infested by Tevansi. Uh, when you put mites again on those plants, they produce more eggs, okay? So we have a nice system in which we have one species that, that induces plant defenses and another one that uh, silences or suppresses those defenses. Uh, this is not exactly like this, okay? I'm just giving you a very simple uh, view of the of the system. What we now know is that there is variation in both species for these traits, but let's let's just for now assume that this is the case like that. Um, what is important here is that these asymmetric responses towards the plant or plant defenses are expected to also translate into a different impact of competition on each phytomite species. And then Diogo again tested this uh, later on. Uh, well, actually not later on. Uh, also during most of his master, actually. And what he did here is that he has a plant with, um, with uh, four leaves, tomato plant, and, and the two, two leaves are connected to a, a dish uh, here below. Uh, and then he puts mites there and he lets the mites decide whether they want to go to the upper leaves or to the lower leaves of the plant. And, in, and sometimes this, the upper leaf is infested with the competitor and sometimes the lower leaf is infested with the competitor and sometimes no plant, no leaf is infested. And then he looks at the distribution of the spider mites on those plants and he also looks at the performance of spider mites on those leaves, okay? And what we can see here is that uh, in the upper graph, you have the number of eggs on each leaf. Uh, so, so that's a measure of performance on each leaf. And you can see that the performance of the Trenkuzutic is higher on the younger leaf. And also when they choose, they also prefer to go to the younger leaves. Um, however, this is only when the plants don't have a competitor. When the plants are in presence of a competitor, uh, what you can see is that there is a modification in their performance. Uh, you can see that when the, the competitor is on the younger leaf, uh, sorry, when the competitor is on... Okay, so when the competitor is on the older leaf, um, the, the, the performance of the two, on the two uh, plant, uh, leaves become more or less equal, which again uh, suggests that, that there is a facilitation effect of the presence of uh, the competitor. Whereas when the competitor is on the younger leaf, you see a, a bigger difference. So the, the, they still have better performance on the younger leaf, but the difference between younger and older is, is bigger. Again, showing this facilitative effect of Urtike on Evansi. And, and however, when you look at the way that Urtike distributes itself, they don't distribute themselves according to the, their relative performance, but they generally try to avoid the stratum where the competitor is present. Okay. Um, so they go to the younger leaf when the old leaf is infested and they go to the younger leaf, to the older leaf when the younger leaf is infested. Uh, so, so this suggests really that the events is probably a very strong competitor and that the effect of the plant suppression is not very strong. Okay. Then if you look at what happens to the distribution of events, uh, again, when the plants are uninfested, they have a higher performance on the younger uh, leaf. So they really prefer the same strata as, as uh, Urtike, which suggests that there will be competition even within plants uh, for, for some particular strata. And they also distribute themselves according to their performance. So they go, they prefer to go to the other leaves. 
Uh, however, in the presence of the competitor, um, uh, basically the competitor has much lower effect on their performance than, the, than when it was the reverse case. But what you can see is that they, they don't, they don't uh, distribute themselves according to their performance, but they also don't specifically avoid the competitor. So it seems that they sort of uh, distribute themselves a bit more evenly across, uh, across strata, but they, and they don't specifically avoid the competitor, and they also don't specifically go to the strata where they have the highest So we suggest that it might be they try to monopolize the resources on, on the planet. Okay. So basically what we learned from this is that they prefer the same strata, so there's probably a lot of competition between them, and that niche modification by the advanced does not seem to benefit sufficiently the competitor to counter its negative competitive effect, and apparently order of arrival affects uh, niche location, okay, it affects where they go and which resources they consume. So, so we see this, and with, with this data, we were questioning ourselves whether these species will coexist in the longer term and whether this coexistence depends on the order of arrival. And this is where uh, Oscar uh, uh, came to save us from, uh, from our ignorance. And then we started uh, collaborating with him because he basically works on coexistence theory and that uh, uh, led us to, to do all sorts of different stuff. So basically about coexistence theory, I'm going, just going to give you a brief presentation. So there are basically two ways by which species can coexist. One is whether they are if, by being sufficiently different uh, such that there is no niche overlap. So one consumes one resources, the other one consumes another resource, everybody's happy. Or by being sufficiently similar such that competitive exclusion will take too long. So basically, if they are very, very similar, they are so similar that they, the, the mechanism that will lead to the exclusion will be there, but it, the difference will be so small that it will take many, many years for uh, the, comp the competitive exclusion to, to operate. So they, it's an effectively neutral uh, situation. So there's no exclusion. And these two mechanisms of coexistence have had their own life separately, and then they were sort of merged together in what is called now the modern coexistence theory, which was basically developed by Peter Chesson and then by many other people. Um, and basically what it says in a nutshell is that coexistence is possible whenever niche differences are sufficiently strong or fitness differences are sufficiently small, okay? And this, there's a nice graph by Fernando Valladares in, in the book, in um, an article that he wrote some years ago. And this is basically it. So um, either you have a lot of uh, niche differences uh, that can compensate for, for, for big fitness differences, or you have very small fitness differences. And so you just need this few niche differences to allow coexistence. That's basically it. However, uh, this theory is all very nice, but it has never taken into account, it has not taken into account uh, the order of arrival of species. And basically it's generally thought that species that arrive first will sort of monopolize the, the environment and that then they will exclude the species that will arrive later. And this is expected to lead to, to positive frequency dependence, right? Because one arrives, takes all, over everything. And this means that there will be priority effects. So whenever there's a difference in the order of arrival, what people expect is that there are priority effects. The one that comes first came first. She took over everything. She ate everything that was in the in the at the table, and everybody else just doesn't starve to death. Okay. And this had not been incorporating into modern coexistence theory until very recently, uh, and it was it was uh, a few years ago. And basically what, uh, what these guys have done is that they sort of have extended the coexistence graph to the left. And so coexistence, as you know, maybe you know, but coexistence is mostly a negative frequency dependent phenomenon, okay? So basically, if, if, you, are, if you have a lot of intraspecific competition, it makes it that, that you, you, you're, you're not so well off. So the ones that are rare, so the, the species that is rare, has an advantage, so it takes over. 
So it's really a negative frequency dependent thing and priority effects is a positive frequency dependent thing. So it's like the, the, the two, two sides of, of, the, of that uh, mirror, okay? So the, this was the way that uh, that priority effects were, or, or that order of arrival was um, incorporated into niche TV, okay? Uh, and then so and so we decided to test this. Okay, we decided to test where the spe our species could coexist and how and whether order of arrival would lead to priority effects and would lead to to this to to, to whether we could see this this whole thing in in our in our experiment. So I, I, when I say we, it was basically Inês Fregata that did an experiment. So basically, what she did was to uh, introduce Utica and Evansi females in boxes with tomato leaves. And she did this either at the same time or Evansi came first or Utike came first, like 48 hours before. And then she varied also the initial frequencies because that's the way that we test, uh, one of the ways by which you can test coexistence series by starting with different initial frequencies and seeing what will be there in the end, okay? And then she counted the number of adult females and registered their location after two generations. And from that, we estimated the growth rate in absence of competitors and the intra and interspecific competitive abilities to just construct the graph that you have seen before. Okay, so basically just to, to give you an idea, what, what you can see here is that you have in the X axis, different initial frequencies and then, so uh, of Urtike or Evansi, we also have the whole uh, only Urtike and only Evansi um, controls, but I'm not showing you here that. So what you can see is that, so in blue, you have both of them coming at the same time. And in the Y axis, you have the proportion of Evansi, okay? So if you're above 50%, you have more Evansi than Urtike. If you're below 50%, you have more Urtike than Evansi. And what you can see is that uh, if they both start at the same time, uh, except if, if Urtike starts at a very, very, very high frequency, uh, you have most, mostly Evansi. Of course, if, if, if Evansi comes first, you get mostly Evansi. But when Urtike comes first, then it sort of stands a chance to um, to, to remain in the population, okay? So if you compare even the 119 Urtike uh, to the 119 Urtike when they come at the same time, there are much more Urtike present. And when they are 10-10, they, you get, you, get, uh, you get a higher proportion of Urtike in the end when they come first. So it does suggest that there is some uh, uh, facilitation here, okay? So basically, Evans is overall a better competitor and when the urtica arrives first uh, or starts at high density, it's not completely eliminated by, by events, which is really cool. Okay, so now what uh, Inez and uh, with the help of uh, Oscar did was to put these uh, data into the plot of coexistence. And what we saw was this, okay? So uh, basically, uh, when when the first when the weakest competitor, which is Urtike, arrives first, you have a chance for coexistence to occur. Okay. So basically, uh, uh, if you could see that this as uh, uh, like a race, you, you you let the crippled go a bit first, you know. So they go first, you know, and then and then you only start running afterwards. So you sort of more or less arrive at the same time of the crippled because you gave them a, a good uh, a good head start. Okay. So and but this is actually really cool and really simple. But uh, nobody had really uh, done this, which I thought was nice. And then uh, uh, what you can see in the left axis of, uh, of left part of the graph is that we don't really have priority effects, right? Because if we would have priority effects, then we would have Urtik excluding when they, it would arrive first and events excluding when it would arrive first. And we don't see that. So basically what we see is that order of arrival has an impact on the pop, on the community, but not via the priority effects that people generally thought, okay? Um, and then we went on to try to look at why was this the case? And then here, what we're showing you here is the, 
the proportion of events on the four different leaves. So again, we have four different tomato leaves and four and five are the youngest leaves. And as you can see, again, they sort of prefer the, the, the youngest leaves. Um, and then um, what, what we saw was that when Urtike came first, they sort of went to the, to the preferred stratum of Evansi and let it uh, become less present in that stratum. So basically they arrive, they go to the best place, they sit next to the chocolate cake basically. And so they, they make it that the, best, that, that the best competitor has to go and eat the, the crumbles of the, the, the other stuff. So it sort of monopolizes a bit, it, not completely, but it sort of gets a bit to the, to the better uh, resource. And so it's, this, this, uh, this allows or this enables the coexistence of the two competitors, okay? Uh, so order of arrival can change the coexistence probability of two herbivores, but not the priority effects or niche modification. And small differences in order of arrival can be sufficient for the monopolization of resources. And these small temporal differences thus percolate into small spatial heterogeneities and this fosters coexistence, which is really cool. Okay. Um, but still, all that I have shown you was basically about ecology and not about evolution. I want to say that all these things can evolve, right? So the way that they interact with a plant can evolve, the way that they interact with each other can evolve. And this was actually what we were supposed to do in the, in the ERC. And we have been doing that in the ERC for the past uh, many years but I don't have the results here to show you right now. They're being analyzed at the moment. I just want to acknowledge that this has been the work of many, many people along many, many years. Uh, I think they are all here, but I'm not completely sure. Um, and that's it, okay? So now I'm going to switch gears for the last 15 minutes, hopefully, um, and uh, uh, talk to you a little bit about host parasite inter interactions. I also think that host parasite interactions are typically um, the type uh, the, of stuff that is studied in very different ways in, uh, in uh, ecology and evolution. Uh, and in particular, herbivorous arthropods are major crops and they are plant parasites in many ecological studies. But people that study uh, host parasite interactions from an evolutionary perspective, they very rarely consider uh, uh, herbivores uh, as, as host parasites, as parasites, okay? And it's a, it's a shame because there's a very, very developed theory of host parasite interactions in, in evolution that is not incorporated into many systems, okay? And we sort of try to do that in this wonderful system that I'm showing you. And here you can really, I mean, you look at this picture and you really think, yes, spider mites are parasites. I mean, they sort of consume the whole plant and they leave nothing left for uh, anyone. So. I think they can be really considered parasites, okay? Um, and so, um, well, basically the fitness of a parasite, so we, as an evolutionary biologist, we're really interested in knowing what is fitness and the fitness of a parasite is basically considered as how many hosts it can parasite in the course of an infection, okay? So how many new infections will be present at the end of the infection period, okay? And this is basically the R0, every, the, the, the R0 that we have heard in the news for the past two and a half years. That's, that's parasite fitness. That's what people have been studying in evolutionary biology for the past uh, 50 years or something. Uh, and interestingly, uh, this, this uh, R0 uh, has the, the important property of including within and between host uh, uh, characteristics. So within a host, the more parasites reproduce, the more parasites will be available to transmit to other hosts. So we sort of expect a positive relationship between uh, within host replication and parasite transmission. But at the same time, parasite replication within a host entails virulence. And virulence is defined as parasite-induced harm to host. So how much fitness, the host fitness is reduced relative to uh, uninfested hosts. And this is then expected to result in fewer transmitting stages being produced because if there is, if hosts are harmed, 
there will be fewer resources in for um, parasites to, to feed upon and thus to produce more parasites to transmit to other hosts. So this may lead to what is called the virulence transmission trade-off. And so parasite meekness depends on the correlation between virulence and replication and between virulence and transmission, okay? And just to give you a bit of a more, a better idea of the virulence transmission trade-off, basically um, what we have here in the x-axis is virulence and the y-axis is parasite thickness, so the R0. And if there's very little virulence, the more virulence there is, uh, the more, uh, so the more parasites will reproduce because, and more parasites will reproduce, they'll, they'll harm the host, but also they will produce more parasites to transmit, so virulence will be positively related to fitness. However, when virulence is very strong, this means that virulence will kill the host or remove a lot of resources from the host, which means that, that there will be much fewer transmitting stages produced. So higher virulence, very high virulence is expected to lead to fewer parasites being produced. And so parasite fitness is expected to be maximized at intermediate levels of virulence. This is what uh, uh, Robert May and Anderson have predicted um, sort of 50 years ago. Okay. And although this is really a very basic idea, we still don't really know, uh, we still don't have many examples of whether this correlation holds of whether we do find the virus transmission trade-off. And we in particularly don't know whether this correlation has a genetic basis or if it's modulated by a host of availability, okay? And so we set out to test this using spider mite isogenic lines. Uh, and when I say we, again, I mean mostly Diogo and uh, Leonor. And they did this in Alison Duncan's lab in Montpellier and with the help of Ines Fregata, Sophie, Laurent, and André. Um, and so we first uh, spent a lot of time generating isogenic lines. We did this uh, by creating first an outbreak population and then deriving uh, uh, many, many isogenic lines by doing 14 generations of seed mating. So brothers and sisters mating with each other, such that in the end, we would obtain a line with basically each line is like one genotype. Not exactly, but close to one genotype, okay? All of this is described in a paper that Yugo has published two years ago. And then with this, this is, approach is very nice because we can measure many traits and their correlations in individuals that have the same evolutionary history um, because they all come from the same output population, but it has also a lot of caveats. So basically we are fixing only the genotypes that have escaped in breeding depression, which in the case of spider mites is not very strong because they're haplodiploid, but still, and we only have access to broad sense heritability, which is not exactly what is important for um, evolutionary biologists, but we are also not really interested in that. We're interested in just having some genetic variants to then measure the correlations, okay? So what we did is that, again, Duke did basically, is to measure um, uh, some traits in, in these uh, lines. So basically, uh, we measured virulence in a, in a method that was uh, also recently published uh, by Andre Mira and, uh, and Lenore and Wish from, uh, from uh, our university. And basically uh, what we had, we found a way, nice way to measure how much uh, damage was caused by the spider mites on the leaves. So, so we sort of measured uh, how much they eat basically and how much they eat translates then into a fitness reduction in the plant, right? Because they sort of lose their, their resources. And we also measured the number of transmitting stages. In, with, in the case of spider mites, this corresponds to the number of adult daughters produced after 10 days. And then we also use different initial densities to have a, a, an effect to, to, to see whether that affected uh, these traits. Uh, and the other thing is that we measure this in the, in the two ways and the two uh, uh, life cycles, let's say. So there are basically a, a continuum of life cycles in parasites, but we sort of divided them in two uh, categories or caricatures, if you will. So some parasites only transmit at the end of the infection period, 
which is very typical, for example, in parasitoids, because they sort of first they eat the whole larvae and then they, they disperse. Um, whereas some other parasites transmit continuously during infection, like most viruses and most herbivores. Okay, and so we wanted to know what is the impact of this uh, of this uh, timing of transmission of host availability, if you will, uh, in the in the correlation between these traits. Okay, and so what we're going to present to you first is whether we, we're going to see whether there's some genetic variance in traits. And we do this by measuring the, the values of our traits in all the isogenic lines or the inbred lines that you see here in the X axis. And so if there's some genetic variance, then we expect, then the, we expect that uh, different lines have different uh, level, the different values for the trait. Um, if there is no genetic variance, however, most variance will be within the lines and not between the lines. Uh, and luckily, we did find uh, significant blood sense heritability in most of the tra in the traits that we that we set out to measure, both under continuous transmission and retransmission at the end of the of the of, period, of the transmission period. And so then we we set out to look at the the correlations between traits, and we found that in both cases, in both types of uh, of uh, host availability there was a positive correlation between virulence and replication. Okay, so the more parasites replicated, the more virulent they were. And of course, this is also the, at the highest densities, they were also, they also produced more virulence and more replication, but there was always a positive correlation between these two traits. However, if you look at the correlation between virulence and transmission, then we see a very different scenario. So in the case there is, continuous transmission, you still always see a positive correlation between virulence and the number of transmitting stages, okay? And this is true for, so we, at, at the continuous transmission, we only have uh, intermediate and high densities. And in, those ca in the, both cases, you see a positive correlation between virulence and transmission. Whereas if you only allow parasites to, to disperse at the end of the transmission of the, of the infection period, then you see that the correlation between virulence and transmission depends on the initial density. So if there's not many, if there are not many parasites, you still see a positive correlation between virulence and transmission. However, if you have a lot of uh, initial parasites initially, which means also that you'll have a lot of parasite, more parasites in the end, then this correlation becomes negative. And, the, and I forgot to say in the previous graph, but also here, it, in the previous uh, correlation, the correlation was genetic. That is that there is a, a, a significant effect of, of the isogenic line identity on the, on the correlation. So there's a part of the variance in this correlation that is explained by the fact that there are different lines. And this is also true for the left hand graph. So under continuous transmission, the correlation between virus and transmission is genetic but it's not when you have transmission at the end of the infection period. So not only we lose the, 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 the we change the, or the, 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 uh, the, the sign of the, of the correlation, but also it's, its nature is changed by uh, enabling transmission only at the end of the infection. So, and in conclusion, the positive genetic correlation and the continuous host availability suggests that this scenario will select for more virulent parasites, but the hump-shaped curve observed when transmission occurred at the end of the infection period suggests that density dependence breaks the positive genetic correlation. So our results also support the prediction that high virulence disadvantages at the beginning of the infection period when many infected hosts are available, but this advantage may be lost uh, later on when fewer hosts are available. And so host availability is really a key aspect shaping the relationship between virulence and transmission and thus the selection pressures posed upon these traits, which we think is a very nice conclusion. Uh, again, however, parasites are never alone and all this uh, may evolve. Um, we recently wrote a review on this a few years ago and we are also now doing experiments to test how this in an evolutionary context will change. And I hope we'll have results pretty soon. 
And that's it. I'd like to uh, thank all the people that uh, they are part of the group and uh, especially those that worked on this and uh, the people that also were nice to give us money to work. And uh, I'll take any questions if there are still people left over. Thank you. Ora, obrigada, Sara. E penso que já temos uma pergunta aqui da professora Margarida Matos. Olá. Hi, uh, I, I'll speak in, in English, right? Uh, ok, Sara, thanks a lot. Uh, um, ni nice uh, survey of uh, several of your, of your work. Um, it's a shame you didn't show the evolution part, but uh, we are all expecting that to appear soon. Uh, uh, about the first part, uh, um, it's just um, a general question. How, how much have you addressed that these types of competition that you showed, always using the same uh, species of plant? Uh, how does it change when you consider a heterogeneous environment, patch environment with many more than one plant? Do you consider that in your studies? Or I don't remember anymore if you um, have that. You mean you mean um, more than one plant numbers or plant species? And not more than one plant species. Ah, yes. Um, uh, no, we, we haven't looked at that. What we have looked at is uh, because, you, as you know, maybe you know, uh, a tomato accumulates metals, and so we did a bit. Um, we did a bit the effect of, uh, of the presence of, uh, of a metal accumulation on the, the probability of coexistence. But, it, but we did that uh, with, uh, with spider mice that have evolved with cadmium or without cadmium and see how the coexistence is affected by this evolution and also by the, um, the, the, the environment. So we did that in plants with cadmium and plants without cadmium. But we did not do that with bean or uh, whatever. Uh, okay. Uh, anyway, yeah. yeah. And uh, the results I cannot tell you right now because I hope that uh, that Ines will work on that this summer. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I would be really curious to see how much complicating the the environment with more than one plant uh, species yeah. might might give. But uh, it's. Uh, uh, yeah. by, by itself, it would be a challenge, yeah. Uh, uh, have you uh, considered also doing, uh, I think that uh, basically, well, you, you cannot apply it really, but it's it generally is um, a hard selection regime that you have, right? Not the soft selection regime, meaning that uh, uh, you, you, you let the populations evolve to yeah. uh, reach very yeah. high densities and you know, don't control density, right? I mean, uh, every generation you pick up 200. So, so you do control a bit, but, but, yeah. but, but whenever you have to, I mean, I, I can only really think about hard and soft with two environments, but maybe yeah. I'm wrong. But no, no, so, I, I, was, I was wondering the same thing, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. When, when- So one is connected with the other, yeah. Yeah, so when there, there are heterogeneous, heterogeneous we yeah. don't look at, we don't collect uh, proportional, to, uh, we just collect, so it, it, it ends up being proportional to the environment, basically. So it's hard selection. So it's hard selection, yeah. yeah. So when you consider the tomato with and without cadmium, it, it's yeah. still hard selection. So, it's yeah. hard. so soft selection may give completely different results, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, but again, yeah, I yeah. would say it should foster uh, uh, Again, this, this will ne never end. OK. Uh, relative to the second part, I'm not going to comment because you already know my comments about using isogenic lines. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs> é o Joel, não é? So, sim. Uh, so, hi, Sara. Um, since both species are herbivores, uh, do you know why uh, the plant is responding in a different manner to both species at the, at the same genus? And if you have also a clue on what's the molecular level, uh, or uh, what's the molecular uh, basis of it. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah. So basically, um, what Diogo uh, in in that paper he studied that then another species also actually that's he that is really his contribution because the events we already knew. 
But we, we studied another species that is called Titanca ludeni, and ludeni also uh, suppresses the plant defenses. And then we know from other people, basically the Chinese and the Japanese, that other, other species of the genus Tetranicus, they induce plant defenses, okay? So there's a variation in the, in the genus, okay? And Ludeni and Evansi, they are sort of much closer together than, than to the others. So that might be, there might be some uh, phylogenetic constraint, let's say. And some people in uh, Amsterdam are working on the mechanistic basis thereof, uh, and basically what they show, I mean, it's not, I'm not sure we really know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure we can say we know, but they do show that they're, they're the saliva of the spider mites is different, okay? So they have, they produce some stuff, they, they sort of spit on the plant, and when they spit, it sort of uh, suppresses the, the defenses. That's, that, that's, that's what they, they know, but, but again, this is... Uh, Ongoing research, I would say. Yes, thank you. Thank you, you. Espera aí, tem aqui uma coisa. Ah, thank you for the presentation. Okay, so. Uh, is there any other questions? I don't think so. Yes. Okay. So, so Sara, thank you so much for your presentation. And thank you. I think we can finish now. Yes, last yes. minute. Okay. <laughs> so see you in the next Encontro Ciencia. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.